Welcome to the Space Telescope Public Lecture Series. Tonight's talk, How Dark is Space? by Dr. Todd Lauer of NSF's Noir Lab. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Summers of the Office of Public Outreach at, here at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And I really always make sure I thank this amazing tech team, Thomas Marufu and Grant Justice, who take this and get it out to you. I also remind you that the Space Telescope Public Lecture Series will be online only until further notice. Our upcoming talks. Uh, we're going to have a talk on November 2nd, but I haven't exactly pinned down who it's going to be and then, of course, what they're going to be talking about. But don't worry, I always make it through. I got a whole bunch of people. I just got to pin it down to just one of them for that. So November 2nd, there will be a talk and we'll find out soon about who that's going to be. On December 7th, we will have the James Webb Space Telescope countdown to launch. That speaker is also to be announced, but that's not my problem. That's somebody else who has to choose who's going to tell you all about this amazing, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope mission as it's going to launch in December. More about that in just a second. In January, on January 4th, uh, Maria Montesquiles will be talking about galaxy clusters, all right? And if you want to know more about uh, these talks, you can go to our website, uh, www.stsci.edu slash public hyphen lectures, or you can just go to your favorite search engine, type in uh, Hubble Public Lecture Series, and you will find this page. Uh, on this page, on the left-hand side, you can find links to our webcast, both on YouTube um, and our webcast archive from the Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, on the right, you can find our sign up for the email. Just simply enter your address, hit subscribe, and you will be on our email list. Also on the website, we have all of the upcoming lectures. Uh, and if you click on one of those lectures, you will get the information about that lecture, uh, the full abstract of the talk, as well as after it's been recorded, links to the SDSCI webcast, as well as the link to it on YouTube. In terms of email, well, as I said, the announcements, it's easiest just to sign up at the website. Uh, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, that is youtube.com. Hubble Space Telescope, all one word, Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, when you subscribe, you will get notices of our new videos, as well as reminders of these live events. Finally, if you have comments or questions, you can send them to the email address publiclecture at stsci.edu. If you would like to follow us on social media uh, for the Hubble Space Telescope, for the James Webb Space Telescope and just STS Space Telescope Science Institute in general. We have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have YouTube, we have Instagram, uh, and you can follow us at the tags there. Uh, myself, I do a tiny bit of social media on Facebook and Twitter. Actually, a lot of it is all about just telling people about the public lecture series. Now, our news from the universe for October 2021. And the top story tonight is the James Webb Space Telescope. Save the date, because we had a wonderful announcement from NASA this month uh, that the James Webb Space Telescope had completed its rigorous testing regimen, and also that Ariane Space had a successful launch in July those two things, the completion of testing and the Ariane Space uh, successful launch, they were uh, allowed them to set a target launch date for the James Webb Space Telescope. And that date is December 18th, 2021, which is of course why we're doing the countdown to launch talk in December. The James Webb Space Telescope is currently in shipment to the launch site and that launch site is the spaceport in French Guiana. This is the Europe, uh, European spaceport um, where you can see, it's just this amazing facility. This is a gorgeous image I found on their website. Uh, and in the front 
uh, of, of this image is where they launched the Ariane 5 rocket. And JWIST, he will be going up in an Ariane 5 rocket. And it also shows you why in this previous picture, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is folded up like this because it needs to be folded up in order to fit in the top of that Ariane 5 rocket. Uh, then after launch, it will have its unfolding and that will be an amazing stuff. And you'll hear all about that in December. So we hope we're gonna have some really, really happy holidays with both the launch and the deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope. Our second story, what's the matter with Galaxy NGC 1052-DF2? which by the way, I'm just gonna call DF2 from now on. But I'm not gonna start talking about DF2 right now. I'm gonna first start talking about large galaxies with this example, the Sombrero Galaxy. Now, these large galaxies, they contain matter, all right? And uh, when you look at them, you can say, oh, well, there's stuff that shines. We'll call this luminous matter, right? And when I say luminous matter, it's not just stuff that you can see with the eye in the optical but it's also stuff that shines in infrared and ultraviolet and x-rays and gamma rays and all the um, wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. So luminous matter is anything that shines, okay? And you can add up all the matter you, that you see that is luminous. You can also get an estimate of the mass in the galaxy using dynamics, okay? We'll call this dynamical matter. So for example, in this disk here, the stars are spinning, okay? They're rotating around in the disk. And the motion of its rotation, the speed of its rotation, it tells you how much matter is producing that rotation, right? So the dynamics of the stars can give you an, an estimate of the mass in the galaxy. Now, for most large galaxies, what we find is that the dynamical matter, the matter you get you know, from the motions, is much, much greater than the luminous matter, okay? Up to a factor of 10. And that means there's some non-luminous matter. And non-luminous, well, we'll just call that dark. So there is dark matter in these large galaxies. Up to 90% of the mass of these galaxies is dark matter. So that's the normal thing. It's kind of weird, but actually it's for us in astronomy, that's, that's the normal. Now, the weird thing is a galaxy like DF2. Now, this galaxy is, wow, it's really a puffball galaxy because when you look at this image, you're actually looking through the galaxy, right? And you can see lots of other galaxies straight through this galaxy. I mean, it's really just, you know, stars in this big puffy cotton ball type shape, but it's not very dense. It's a low density galaxy that you can see straight through. And some previous work on this galaxy had shown that it had very little or no dark matter. And there were competing groups that said, yes, it does, no, it doesn't, yes, it does, no, it doesn't, which is the way that science works, right? And in order to really settle this question, they needed an accurate distance. Because if this galaxy is further away, then it's bigger, okay, um, and would be more massive, right? And that would make the dark matter a problem. But if it's closer in, if it's closer to us, then it's smaller and it's really not that much of a problem, okay? So what are they gonna do? Well, you're gonna call Hubble and Hubble can see the individual stars in this galaxy. Uh, and this pullout, what you're supposed to notice are all those little red dots, okay? Those red dots are red giant stars. And there is a method called the tip of the red giant branch uh, and where that the red giant stars reach a maximum brightness. And from that maximum brightness, you can accurately measure the distance to this galaxy. And that's what they did with DF2. The result was that the distance was actually larger than previously thought, pushing it further away, making the galaxy bigger, and making the problem with the dark matter even more problematic. There is a maximum of about a few percent dark matter in this galaxy. That is strange. So the questions we then ask are, well, how can a galaxy this large form without any dark matter or very little dark matter in it, 
right? We don't understand a formation scenario because usually the dark matter serves as the gravitational seed that pulls everything in to form the very large galaxies. Well, this is a, you know, sort of a dwarf galaxy level one. It's a, you know, about a billion stars, whereas our Milky Way galaxy is like 200 billion stars. But those billion stars are spread out over a volume similar to the size or even larger than the size of our Milky Way galaxy. So this is a strange galaxy in multiple ways. Furthermore, when you find one object of this type, you always have to ask, well, are there others? And the main research group that announced this uh, discovery uh, says they already have one more, which is a similar galaxy to this, it's uh, DF4. And uh, they thought that they were close together in the same group. They actually turned out to be a bit farther, farther apart than they thought, uh, but they're going to study to find if they can find a class of these galaxies, what environments they live in, and use that to help understand how these galaxies without much dark matter could have formed. Stay tuned. Now our spe speaker tonight uh, is uh, coming to us uh, as a very special uh, guest. Uh, Todd has uh, a wonderful reputation amongst astronomers. He's a just a, a brilliant speaker, so you, I know you're really going to enjoy him. Uh, he works at the NSF's National Optical and Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, he got his degrees from Caltech for his bachelor's and his PhD from University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, he also worked at Princeton before joining the Noir Lab. Um, and uh, he has a wonderful history with the Hubble Space Telescope. He was part of the original Wide Field Planetary Camera team. Um, and he's worked on things like black holes, galactic structure, stellar populations, and large scale structure. Uh, recently, uh, he joined the New Horizons team for what he's going to tell you about tonight. Um, and I won't step on his, uh, his things. And I would just finish with in uh, early in his career, he received the national, the NASA Exceptional Science Achievement Award for his work on Whitefield Planetary Camera One. So uh, Todd, will you turn on your video and such and share your screen? I will share Great. my I will share there my you. screen. Okay. Let's All right. See. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the eminent Todd Lauer. All right. The eminent Todd Lauer needs to find the share button. There it is. Okay. Goody. Let's see. Okay. And there. Okay. Thank you, Frank, for that wonderful introduction. So I'm going to talk about how dark is space. And why not start? with this wonderful graphic by this uh, French surrealistic graphic illustrator, Guy Bilot, who does these things for magazines, newspapers, what have you. And the concept that he has here is very simple. You have a couple of astronomers looking out the dark slit of an observatory, pitch black, but wait, there are shadows there. There's light coming from the black space. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. You know, is there light coming from empty space? And if there is, what do we learn from that? How do we know about it? How do we measure it? And what do we learn from it? So the first question that we can take up is, so why is it dark at night? And your first reaction is like, well, you know, I, I think it has something to do with the sun going down. I need an astronomer to tell me this, you know. Uh, but yeah, so it, you know, the sun goes down and it gets dark at night, but you know, why, why isn't there light at, at night? Um, there's a lot of things there. Here's a picture over at the Antarctic, uh, way at the South Pole, which is one of the darkest places on Earth. And there is the Milky Way. And you can see <clears throat> you know, a couple of our little satellite galaxies. The Magellanic Clouds are there in the upper left of the screen. And the image is peppered with stars and enough light, if you will, you know, that with a long exposure with a camera, you can see you know, the South Pole even at night. So there is light coming from, from space, but it's dark. And I say, okay, well, sure, you know, uh, there's stars there. We're looking at 400 billion suns in the Milky Way galaxy right there in front of us. But, uh, you know, you have to be a dark place to see. A little bit of city light will push away those 400 billion suns. 
And so you say, well, they're far away and they're not that bright. And that's why it's dark. But if I put a galaxy behind this, it'll be brighter. If I put another galaxy behind it, it would be brighter still. If I piled it up, it would be extremely bright. And in fact, if you look right into the heart of the Milky Way, you see stars spread like dust as billions of stars on top of each other. In this image, you really can't separate one from the other. But it's still very, very faint. And this was something that came up, an old discussion from a gentleman named Olber. It was called Olber's Paradox. If you looked out at the universe at night, and eventually, if it were infinite, you would hit another star. Stars upon stars, no matter how far you look, and then you say, well, they get fainter when they're further away, but there's more when you get further away, and it perfectly balances. Them. And the night sky should be as bright as the surface of the sun. And so the question, why is it dark as night, actually has this subtlety, and it says something about the universe. And if you looked at it and said, well, there's not that much stuff out there, then you've made a profound conclusion, which is correct. No, no need to take a fancy course in astronomy. You say it's dark at night, it means there's not that much stuff out there. The universe is finite. In the particular case, you say, does it go on in space or does it go on in time? The answer from the Big Bang is that the universe has a beginning. And so the deeper answer to why does it get dark at night, the answer is because the universe is only 13 billion years old. It had a beginning and that we've learned why it's dark at night. And I put this here to illustrate a little bit of Olber's paradox, which is, you know, imagine yourself in a forest. Instead of stars, we're going to be looking at trees and more trees in the distance. And you see here in this particular rendition that a lot of the trees overlap. Initially, you know, ultimately you will be looking at solid wood if the forest is big enough. You can see some uh, clear sky over there at the right. You know, this is a little tiny stand of trees. It's not that big. And so it is. And that's, that's the same thing is that, you know, if the universe were infinite, ultimately everywhere you look, you would sit, see the surface of a star. So that tells us right now that the question, why is it dark at night is actually interesting. It tells us something about the universe. It tells us something profound. The universe has finite age. And that's pretty good. And actually, I'm afraid that what I'm going to tell you further may be a bit of a come down from that, because we know it's dark. We know why it's dark. And we're going to ask instead, how dark is it? It's dark, but how, how, how subtly dark is it? And can we learn something from that? And so let's look at this incredible image. At first glance, this may not look like much. It's a black image with lots of dots of color on it and speckles and what have you. It is uh, the deepest image ever taken with anything, the Hubble Space Telescope. You wanna take a long exposure with your camera, you open the shutter for a while and you let the light build up. This is what you get if you take the Hubble Space Telescope and you let the light build up for 11 days. 11 days of orbiting around the earth, taking one picture after the other, after the other, after the other, and adding them all together. And what you're seeing here are galaxies and everything there is a galaxy. I showed you the image in the center of the Milky Way galaxy of you know, billions of suns. Well, this is an image looking at that shows the universe has billions or almost trillions of galaxies. Everything here is a galaxy. Uh, many of them are bigger than our own galaxy. And critically, um, we're looking back in time because light takes a long time to get to us. It's called the redshift. It tells us how far away things are. You know, the universe is expanding. The further away things are, the faster they're going, the further away. And uh, so we measure the speed that they're receding from us that tells us how far away they are. And they're so far away that the look back time, as we call it, is significant. The age of the universe is about 13.6 billion years. The Earth is only 4.6 billion years. Most of what we're seeing here, the light came to us from the time before the Earth was made. And let's step into this a little bit. Um, I have a movie here. 
was actually made by Frank Summers, who uh, gave that uh, wonderful introduction. And we're going to take the ultra deep field and we're going to take the red shifts and we're going to turn them into distances and then we're going to fly into it. And so you're going deeper into this and you're going back in time. Back before the earth was made. And ultimately, because it's what we see in this picture, we look back in time, we can see when galaxies were being made. And that's what we've learned by looking at pictures of this. But what I want you to look at in this picture is the emptiness of space as the galaxies go by. It's actually very clean. You might expect little galaxies to be next to big galaxies or pieces of galaxies have come off in their collisions and interactions with each other. And that's true. And as powerful as the Hubble Space Telescope is, it cannot see infinitely deep. When you look back in time, we run out of galaxies. They're redshifted too far to see, and a lot of them haven't been made yet. And this region is what the James Webb Space Telescope is going to do. It's going to look even further back in time, earlier in the creation of the universe than we could even do with the Hubble and the ultra deep field. But it's all counting galaxies. And even with the most powerful instrument, you ultimately run out of photons. And so the question is, how much, how much light are we getting from everything? That we can add up because maybe a galaxy is not bright enough or it's too far away or it's too small to make a point that the Hubble can see, but its light is still there, it'll make a fog. And so we ask in the picture like the ultra deep field, how deep or how black is it between the galaxies? Because that will tell us what we're missing. And there's a little trick here. The Hubble isn't any good at that. The James Webb Space Telescope will be no good at that. And the reason is because the Hubble orbits the Earth, it's in the inner solar system. And the James Webb uh, Telescope will be out a little further in the moon, but it's still gonna be close to the Earth. And being caught in the inner solar system, it's vulnerable to a lot of the dust that the sun lights up. So there's a fog, you know, this is, this is the, the, the dense city as it were, you know, and we've got this bright sun and it's lighting up all this dust from the asteroids grinding into each other and it fogs ultimately the images that we look at with the Hubble Space Telescope. So if I measured how bright that black is, actually it would be very, very bright. It would be much brighter than what, what we could understand. And the reason is, because that's just the light from dust in the inner solar system. It's a false signal. And so that's why we're asking how dark it is because we would like, okay, to look between the galaxies and add up over the history of the universe, how much light is coming from everything that made up light, but the dust is blocking us out. It's just the glow is too bright. We have to get away from that. And so the solution which I will talk about at length is to use new horizons, which is at the edge of the solar system. But it's an interesting question. Um, you know, is there something unexpected? What is the background? And we know that the universe actually has um, backgrounds. And this is, this is a full sky image. So it looks funny if you've seen uh, pictures uh, you know, of the globe that show all the nations to get, you know, all the continents, everything. That's the same kind of projection. This though is the background to the universe that was very young. This is not in light that we look at, this is in microwaves. If you've heard about the microwave background, this was discovered in the 60s by two scientists working for Bell Labs, um, Penzias and Wilson, who found static uh, in their communication antenna that they couldn't understand and being very dutiful because they wanted to have great microwave communications with their satellites, they tracked down the source of noise and it turned out to be coming from the universe itself. And as a revolutionary discovery, it is why we believe in the Big Bang because the Big Bang predicted this. And the old theories went by the wayside when we started you know, seeing the microwave background. And so we study this for the early history of the universe. And what you're looking at is a map made with uh, the Planck satellite. And you see the colors, it's measuring temperature of the early universe. And, um, or as we see it now, red shifted. And red is a little hot, blue is cold. It's fractions of a degree, actually about a thousandth of a degree, uh, what you're seeing here. <clears throat> 
But where it's concentrated, where it's a little bit bumpy, that's where matter is going to gather as the universe ages and turns into the galaxy clusters. The empty regions, which are dark, will expand and become even more empty. And this is the start of the large scale structure of the universe. And we got that by looking at the microwave background. So what kind of other backgrounds are there? Well, we know that there's an X-ray background. We know there's an infrared background. How about an ordinary light? Uh, astronomers have <coughs> a little confusing term for it. We call it the optical background. But we want to ask, is there a background between the galaxies um, which we're not aware of? And you know, if we get away from the inner solar system where you know, the sunlit dust you know, fogs us out, do we see something or we discover something interesting? And so a theme that I'm going to play throughout the rest of this talk is um, how black is black, how dark is dark. And the thing is, we are used to seeing light coming from dark or black things. And so I put up this picture here. Um, this is a picture in front of um, our house in Tucson, uh, Arizona. That's Beatrice Muller, my wife, who's a fellow astronomer. And uh, we've been living in this house for 25 years. And um, the street in front was pretty old and decrepit and beat up and potholed. And we were very excited, this, you know, our excitement being at home with the pandemic, you look for stuff like this, they decided after all this time to repave uh, the street. And you've seen, you know, how black fresh asphalt is. And it's really striking here. You know, the old asphalt you can see in the lower uh, right corner. And here's this jet black strip. It's very, very black. A little bit later, when they paved the other side, they went out on the uh, fresh asphalt. And on, there was, you know, the stuff on the left, which had gotten a bit scuffed up over a week. But then they paved the right part. And that was black asphalt, as jet black, um, as you saw in the previous picture. But, you know, it was in bright sunlight. And I decided to take a picture of it. And you see the shadow I made. That's even darker still. And so, yes, that asphalt was really, uh, was really black, but you know, uh, when you actually put a cast a shadow on it, you can see, well, no, there's actually still quite a bit of light coming from it. And if you look at my shadow though, you can see that there's a little speckles and that's where, you know, the sunlight, uh, you were even the stuff, not the sunlight because I'm shading it, but all the light from the sky is actually lighting up the bright little uh, pebbles and other things. And so you can see there's even light coming from the shadow. In fact, it's very surprising you see something that's completely dark. And that's why I put this next picture of something that I just think is fascinating. Uh, there's a paint you can buy called Vanta Black. Vanta Black reflects only 1% of 1% or 1 ten-thousandths of, of, of the light that hits it. And you're looking at uh, two identical busts. The one on the left in brass, there is the same thing on the right. It's just been painted with Vanta Black. It's not a piece of construction paper, it's not flat. It is as 3D as the picture on the left, but there's no light coming from it whatsoever. And you lose any cues at all at what you're looking at. There's no shadows, there's no shading, there's absolutely nothing, just complete blackness. And we're not used to seeing things that black. And so this will come up at various times as I explain what we did, you know, how black, how black is black. And now I'm going to get into a little bit of what I did and what I, my friends and collaborators did with me. This is a team effort. This is a technical um, uh, slide that I use for technical talks. And there's uh, the fancy term for what we're looking for is the cosmic optical background. An optical is an astronomer's word for ordinary light, you know, light that you can see with your eyes, you know, that glass works with to bend around optics. And so we call it optic. If you use x-rays, you have to use something else to do that microwaves to see that background require different instrumentation. Here we just use lenses and mirrors. And so it's optics will work and we call that optical light. And so we're looking for the optical background. New Horizons um, is at the edge of the solar system. It's 50 times right now, 50 times further away from the sun than the earth. It's away from the sun and all the dust and everything that sun lights up. And so with New Horizons, which is, is leaving the solar system, is hanging out in the galaxy, we have the opportunity to look and see if we can measure something about the universe in the background with New Horizons instead of, say, the James Webb Space Telescope or the Hubble Space Telescope. 
So this is New Horizons. Uh, it's a beautiful little spacecraft. This, it was launched in 2006. This is down at Cape Canaveral uh, shortly before it's launched. It's actually very small. The, the, the joke always is, you know, the shape and size are about right for a baby grin. And I think that's a fair description. You have a radio dish there for sending stuff back. It's wrapped in mylar to keep it uh, insulated. And um, it's going, it was used to explore both Pluto and Jupiter. And it was sent out the solar system in January 2006 on this Atlas rocket. It ejected it uh, from the Earth at the highest velocity that any spacecraft has departed the Earth. Um, Apollo astronauts took three days to get out to the moon, New Horizons. Uh, you would pass the moon in eight hours. And so we escaped the Earth. We left the you know, solar system with it. We went past Jupiter. Jupiter uh, the little slingshot and threw uh, the New Horizons even further out into space. Uh, enabling us to get to Pluto in a reasonable amount of time. And the primary mission was exploring Pluto, uh, which we did in January, January, excuse me, July of 2015. And this was the same, we turned, we took Pluto, which was a little fuzzy dot, and we turned it into a whole new planet and world uh, to explore. And we went further, um, uh, January, New Year's in 2019, we looked at the Kuiper Belt object, which was even further away, is 40 times further away from the sun, Arakoth. And this is about the size of Manhattan and uh, is what we hope is typical of Kuiper Belt objects, none of which had been seen up close before. And we learned just looking at these images with other things we did, we really you know, learned quite a bit of how, how they're formed and how the Kuiper Belt evolved. And New Horizons uh, is leaving us, is going deeper, into space and out ultimately into the Milky Way galaxy. And you can see its trajectory here. So there is its launch down on Earth in 20, uh, 2006, out past Jupiter for the slingshot. Pluto, as I said, in 2015, Arakoth, 2019. And right now uh, it's 50, what we call AU. That's, AU is a little bit of a ruler that we use for measuring distance in the solar system. It's very handy. Uh, the Earth's the size radius of the Earth's orbit is one AU. So if a distance of one AU, that means Earth, things close to us. Jupiter is at five, very simple numbers. Pluto is at like about 33. Arakoth was at 44. We're now at 50 AU, getting further away. And space is very, very dark. And that space is absolutely dark where, where New Horizons is going. I would like to introduce the team, um, the work um, that I'm talking about here was done uh, with the New Horizons team. Uh, I have to say this is the finest group I've ever worked with. Um, there is a science fiction show um, that some of you may have seen at various times uh, with in the title as they narrated is the statement, you know, to go boldly where no one has gone before to explain, explore strange new worlds. And this group really did that. Uh, they explored Pluto, uh, they explored Arakoth. We're looking for some place or for a third place to go. And they made it work. <clears throat> and it has been my pleasure to work with uh, this group of people over the last six years. I should introduce a few of them. Uh, the PI there is Alan Stern, who is third from the left in the center. Uh, he is at Swery uh, Southwest Research in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, to his right is Hal Weaver, the deputy PI, uh, who is at uh, Applied Physics Laboratory in Maryland. It's operated by Johns Hopkins University, so it's APLJHU, we call it for short. And that's where this picture is taken, where the camera is operated out of. And then there's a left, Glenn Fountain, um, who is the, was the project manager. And then the incredible Alice Bowman, who's the chief engineer in our version of Scotty, if I uh, carry the uh, Star Trek metaphor um, uh, a little bit further, who knows every bit and piece of how New Horizons works and saved the day actually for the Pluto encounter when we had a little bit of a difficulty with the spacecraft. And then back about a hundred people. And I've been my pleasure to know most of these people and what they've done. And they've been very dedicated to getting the best out of the mission. I also want to introduce uh, my friend and, and uh, long collaborator, Mark Postman, who is 
not on the team, but is an expert uh, with uh, the populations of galaxies and universe. And I brought Mark in uh, to help us out. Mark being curious about everything helped out for you know, more than populations of galaxies. And it was a key player in the work I'm about to show you. So we're gonna measure how dark space is with New Horizons. The camera we're going to use is called LORI, uh, Long Range uh, Reconnaissance Imager, LORI, uh, New Horizons. This is a picture of it. It's out the back side of the spacecraft. Actually, it was closed on that first picture I showed you, but I could have pointed out the port. If you look in there, and I'll move my cursor around, the primary mirror here, it's a small telescope. It's about eight inches uh, in diameter. Some of you watching probably have telescopes that big or larger. So it's a small amateur size reflective telescope. And this is just reflecting the back wall. That's a, that's a uh, sort of standard mirror. Uh, this is the secondary, you know, the light hits their focus is here, bounces back, goes down this black tube and then into the instrument uh, itself where it's recorded. It's a CCD of small, CCD compared to CCDs, only 1K by 1K, uh, smaller than what you have in your typical camera. I, I can't resist pointing out something though, because this will come up, uh, and this is more deal with how black is black. Uh, you see that the camera has these little baffles in it uh, to prevent scattered light, but also notice that it's not perfectly black. This one you can see is a little gray, and this one's deeper in. You can still see it. Here's one, the third one in, you can see it. So. There's still some light getting around from these and that will come up in an interesting way. And so to measure um, the darkness of space, we're going to look out into our galaxy. And this is a, a full sky image of the Milky Way galaxy. It was taken with data from uh, the Gaia satellite operated by the European Space Agency. And down here again, you can see the little Magellanic clouds or satellite galaxies. And you can see a little bit of a difficulty. You wanna measure um, the background light from the universe, but this big old galaxy is in the way. You got this plane here, you know, we're not gonna look here. There's the bulge, the black hole that you know, the Event Horizon Telescope uh, imaged is right there smack in the middle. So it's not gonna be good to look here. And you to look at this and say, well, how about there? Well, it's still bright. You can see it fades away as you get you know, towards the poles, but you know, we're in the disk. There's no place that we can go where there aren't any stars. There's a lot of stars in the sky, even when you look away from the Milky Way galaxy. And you can see that here again, you know, right here, it's very dark, but it's not perfectly black. So even at what we call the galaxy poles, so let's say this is the equator, this is the North Pole and South Galactic Pole, and we even have a system of galactic latitude that we use. You know, it's our own little coordinate system for, you know, bopping around the galaxy. We have galactic lat longitude, galactic latitude, here are the poles. So we wanna be far away from the plane of the galaxy. You know, we're gonna look up somewhere here where the star is least thinner than everywhere else. And, you know, we will see the distant universe. So there's no question about that. Uh, we have some other stuff to worry about. And this is another view of the galaxy taken in another uh, wavelength. This is an infrared image uh, of the Milky Way galaxy made with the Japanese Akari satellite. And you can see the plane of the galaxy. This is the same coordinate. There's all, you know, where the stars are. There's the black hole in the center again. But gosh, look at what we're looking through. Um, it's kind of cottony and fluffy up here. And it may look like, if you use your imagination a little bit, like the little cirrus in the daytime sky, you know, when the storm is coming in, you know, on the next day. So you see cirrus clouding up the clear sky. And in fact, we call this imaginatively infrared cirrus because we're looking at the actual heat radiation coming off the dust. It's not lit up um, by reflecting light. It's actually, uh, you know, at, at 100 microns, you can actually see uh, the dust directly just by the warmth that it gives off, but it's everywhere. It doesn't absorb a lot of light, but it does scatter uh, light from the Milky Way. And this is something we have to think about. But here though is an illustration of the problem I started talking about. Notice this band that cuts across the galaxy like this. Well, what's that all about, okay? Well, in a different coordinate system, that's the plane of our solar system. It's, we've made this projection for the galaxy. And so that's why it turns into an S because you know our solar system cuts at an angle about 66 degrees to the Milky Way. And this is what's called zodiacal light. It's called zodiacal because the plane 
of our solar system defines the zodiac constellations. And if you look anywhere out in the plane, you'll see that's where the zodiac constellations are. And the dust in our solar system is very concentrated around that. The sun lights it up. In this case here, the heat from the dust is visible. And this is the band of zodiacal light that completely bedevils your ability in the inner solar system uh, to look to the distant universe. And it's very concentrated here, but even at now we're gonna call it the ecliptic poles because the ecliptic, that's our solar system. It has its own poles, north and south. And even over here, you can't see it in this map, but there's still dust there. And that's because we, the earth is in the plane of the solar system, it defines the plane of the solar system. There's dust all around us. And even if I look off of the zodiac, I still get zodiacal light. And so there's a background from dust, no matter where you look. And this is, um, you know, something you can see yourself. Again, you know, you go to a faint, uh, you know, away from the city to look for the Milky Way. I can go to uh, outside the city and I can see, you know, in the right time of year, zodiacal light. And that, you know, is a bright glow around the zodiac. And it's, it's fascinating. I've seen it only a few times in my life and I've seen it, it's been incredibly clear. It's very striking. You have to be in a dark place to see it, but it's very striking when you see. Typically, I think, you know, sorry, actually this is a good time of year, October or March are a good time to see it. Um, but that is, in this case, you know, in, in again, the visible light, this is the dust scattering light from the sun. It's very bright. You wouldn't look for faint galaxies, uh, you know, looking right through zodiacal light, but it is there at some level of the whole sky. And this now is more of a technical diagram. I won't get into it. This, this little cute picture here, that's a, a map of dust density in the solar system looking down on it. There you see these AU again. Uh, heliocentric distance, distance, that fancy word for distance from the sun. Pluto's about 30, you know, Jupiter is like five. So right here, you know, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter all crammed into this first tick mark. The look at what happens if you're in the plane, the, the strength of the zodiacal light drops by a factor of almost 10,000 by the time I get out here to 50 AU. Off the plane, um, you know, it's still, it's still a substantial drop going out here. And this is where New Horizons is. And that's why we want to use New Horizons for this, because it's clean out there. We do not have zodiacal light bothering us. So where do we look? This is another infrared map. Um, it's taken by, in this case, the old IRS satellite, uh, which uh, flew in, in the 80s. And, you know, again, you don't want to look, uh, you know, where the Cirrus is strong and scattering light from the galaxy. So you do want to look at the poles. Uh, we didn't, for this work I'm describing, we actually didn't use New Horizons directly. As it turns out, uh, for just calibration purposes, looking at distant asteroids and whatnot, you know, New Horizons had a lot of observations over the sky. We keep them in an archive for future scientific use. In this case, we searched through the archive and said, oh, well, you know, there's some of these far away from the galaxy and some of the exposures are deep. These actually would be good for trying to find the optical background of the universe. And so this is what we started with. And there were seven fields that we were able to identify, which were suitable for doing this measurement. And so what do you see when you looked at these images? This is what they might look like. It really doesn't look like much. And I deliberately distorted these for a particular re uh, reason. I'm showing you uh, the seven fields that we looked at as if they were seen with space telescope as dark as space telescope could get. And I set this up to contrast with what we're going to see with New Horizons, and this is this. It turns out that you pick the darkest sky that space telescope can see, and you look at it with New Horizons, it's right off the, uh, right off the bat, you know, over 10 times darker. And as good as space telescope is, it can find incredibly faint galaxies, incredibly faint stars, but it does through, uh, through a sky which is still relatively bright. And that's the brightness at the space telescope. This is what we're looking at. And so what do I want to do? Uh, or what do we want to do? And the answer is, okay, uh, it looks pretty simple. And if I gave you these images, you could try to do it yourself. Let's say, well, okay, uh, you know, I've got these images. Yeah, there's lots of stars in even, even these images, because again, you saw that image of the stars everywhere. 
there's some faint galaxies that have to go, but no, they're not incredibly crowded. So let's look around and um, make a measurement between the stars. Let's block, block the stars out and measure things in between, and we'll make a measurement. And that's the measurement of how bright the background sky is. But that leads to a lot of work, which I'm going to talk to you about, because there's other things that come in besides this background that we're looking for. And that's what we had to be very careful about. One of the first questions is, are you fooling yourself in, in some way that, that you don't know about? Um, nighttime is something in a way that doesn't really exist in the universe, um, even where it's dark. Uh, being at night is really in the shadow of the sun. If you're on a spacecraft, uh, even you know, 50 AU out, you're still in bright sunlight. The sun is, is surprisingly bright, uh, even at, you know, as far as we've gone. I mean, being able to lit up Pluto for us, lit up Arakoth, you know, quite easily. And so it lights up the spacecraft as well. And so the first question was, you know, we had to make sure that we were looking you know, fully away from the sun with these images that we found in the archive. Well, we, we selected them that, you know, they were at least angularly far away from the sun. Um, but we were concerned, um, you know, was there light that was getting in anyway? So here is, um, here is, you know, what the spacecraft looks like, just lit up in sunlight. And there's Lori there, you know, it's, it's aperture. It has a door which opens, it opens only once. It's blown open and it stays open for the whole mission. But wait, what are these things here? Ah, gee, okay, well, these are, help us with navigation. These are our star trackers, which we get the position of the spacecraft from, and they kind of stick out a little bit. Oh, gosh, um, you know, oh, are they lit up by the sun? And this is, by the way, why you work with a good team. Um, there was a team member um, named Mark Bowie, who is incredibly clever with anything with the spacecraft, and I, and I didn't know what to talk to him about, except, you know, I asked Mark, what, tell me what I don't know. And he said, you should think about the spacecraft. And then I talked to um, a planetary astronomer who was an artist uh, named Dan Durda, who was not on the team, but close to the team. And he had a, this, art, this model which rendered New Horizons just because he liked putting it in images. And we used that to do the geometry of those fields. And we said, how, you know, when New Horizons was making those observations, was it dark enough? And so we did figured out the geometry for those images. We figured out the geometry of the spacecraft. We lit it up with the sun. And here are for five of the fields. I said there are seven, but two of the fields, you know, have the exact same geometry. And you see, look at this. Okay, <clears throat> here's the sun. Let's lit this up here. And there are those star trackers. Ooh, okay, they're lit up a little bit. Oh gosh, here they're lit up a lot. Oh, what's this? Oh, that's this. This little latch thing over here, Lori. Oh gosh, that's in a little bit of sunlight too. Hmm. And then we stuck, you know, we measured how much light we were getting in, and we're pleased to find out um, that, you know, not much was getting in the camera. In fact, the trivial amount wasn't going to hurt us. But this is the kind of th thing you have to think about. You know, when you're measuring how dark something is, what's the light that's coming in that's bothering you that has nothing to do with that? In fact, um, we had a, a, a telecon once and when you know we we're working on this and I remember Alice Bowman was there and Alan Stern was there and you know, we were killing time before it started and, then, and I asked Alan so are you sure that there's no navigation lights in the spacecraft because Alan is a, a pilot and and is really you know loves thinking about spacecraft and there's no reason to put navigation lights on new horizons but it would look cool all the same and this you know got laughters around the group was, no we're not going to put <laughs> we're not going to put light bulbs to wink on and off you know the enterprise has them but new horizon doesn't but it's that kind of thing you think about you know what light could be there that you haven't thought about it's going to give you a positive signal it's going to be completely wrong because you didn't account for it and that's what we had to do and that's why we got this rend rendering software to look and see you know was there something coming in well, we got another thing to worry about. Um, you know, what about starlight? We're looking at, at fields. You saw there are stars in the images, but what about bright stars away from? They're not in there, but they're still putting light into the camera. And we know what, uh, how Lori, the camera responds. This is again, another technical graph, but this is actually how it responds to sunlight. Notice this compressed scale here. It's uh, what we got there. We got 100 million there and we got 100 million for there. So that's 16 orders of magnitude. Um, and the light goes with sort of like uh, 14 of those. And I had to use a new word quadrillion. You've got 
million, billion, trillion, and then the thousand trillions is a quadrillion. And so sunlight coming straight into the camera, if you pointed the camera at the sun, which by the way would ruin it, um, yeah, but going all the way out to 90 degrees here, the sunlight intensity drops by, by a quadrillion. But if you point near the sun, um, whoops, not ready for that one yet, you still see sunlight coming in very faintly. And the sky is actually pretty bright unless you're actually in the New Horizon shadow because the, the sunlight is hitting directly into the lorry aperture and it's scattering around. Remember that baffle was not you know, completely perfect. You can still see it, which means it's scattering light. And if that can scatter sunlight, uh, well, star, a bright star, you know, is gonna get in the same way. It's not gonna be that bright, but you better think about it, okay? Because you're looking for something very faint. And so we made, uh, we took every um, catalog we, we could get to help us out. We, and we were going from very bright stars to very faint stars. This is something that Mark and I worked on very, very closely. It took us three catalogs. We needed a catalog of bright stars that you could see with your own eye. And then we needed a, a catalog with, you could see with small telescopes. And that was a Parkus. And then we needed Gaia to get us to the faintest stars that Laurie could see. And this is, this is, again, more technical to the diagram, but this is what we had to worry about. So here is the field of view of Lori, another logarithmic scale, 10th of the degree, one degree, 10 degrees. So this is you know compressed. But we said, what star is putting what into Lori? This is, to, to be in the camera, you have to be inside this thing. But what's this over here? Here is a star and the brightness, zero to five. Those are stars you can see with your eye. Uh, binoculars out to seven, small telescopes out to 14, big telescopes out to 20, if you look in them. So bright faint. I don't know what this star is, but it has a name and the, the astronomer will almost certainly know, know it by name. And it's 10 degrees away, not even close to the camera, but gosh, we know from our little scale here that there's a lot of light going to come from that. And here is something that's third magnitude. These are called magnitudes. It's three that's putting in a lot of light into this. And so we had to go over the whole sky, integrate up with all these star catalogs and ask the question, how much scattered light were we getting into? Because again, if we didn't think about that, we say, oh, look at all that light we're getting. And it's completely wrong because we didn't account for this. Now there's something else we have to think about. So here we're back at the ultra deep field. And these are these beautiful uh, galaxies that took Hubble a week to detect and pick up. Well, they're gonna be in our field too. And we have a small telescope and we won't see them like Hubble will, but they're just gonna put in light all the same. So we better account for uh, how much galaxy lights in there. So that's something else we had to worry about. And this is something again that uh, Mark and I worked on. This is excessively technical. And so I, excuse me for showing this, but this is, this is a scientific way of presenting what we know about the populations of galaxies uh, in the universe. You see uh, six little plots. Well, those are different colors. Um, if you looked in the ultraviolet light, blue light, V band, that's called visible band. That's what the eye is most sensitive, sensitive to. It's kind of green, red, infrared, and then a little bit uh, further infrared. So these are different colors. And you see there's a steep curve and this is faint this way, and this is number this way. So here we go from this way. Okay, galaxies in green light, not many bright ones, lots and lots, oops, let me see my cursor, lots and lots of faint ones, and this is true for all of them. There's another curse, stars do the same thing, but they're easier to get rid of. It turns out when you get past a certain faintness, it's galaxies that you see, not stars. There aren't as many of them. But this is something else that we had to account for is how much galaxy light were we getting? So here's the answer um, that uh, we were going for. And so we had seven fields that we looked at and here are our measurements from seven fields. And we got a solid signal in all the fields. You can see there are error bars there. That's pretty precise, look at that. And I won't tell you what the units are unless you know that you're good and you know what nanowatts per meter square per steradian is. There's probably some of you who don't know what that is and I won't explain it. Um, I actually hope to explain it better than that, but just take the number. And so whatever this mysterious, mysterious number is, take like 35, we see 35 of this thing and you know, it, it doesn't matter what you call it. If we're using Hubble Space Telescope, which is all fogged out compared to this, 
this would be up at 300 or 1,000, okay? So what we're seeing is really dark. But that's just a raw signal, and that, that's what we measured from that slide several times back. I just showed you the pictures, and this is what I get, you know, when we just measure it off the pictures. So is there something here, and we need to you know, look at the budget, what could be making this signal up here is it something interesting or is it something obvious or is it something stupid? So I was just talking about galaxies. So let's talk about galaxies. Whoop, wrong cursor. Let's go back so you see. Yeah, so here we go. So I said there are faint galaxies that are in our field that we can't see. How much light did they put in? That's the blue. So, okay, and you know, we compared to lots of different people who you know, work with galaxy counts and that number is pretty good. Uh, it's known from the work with Hubble, it's gonna be refined with the James Webb Space Telescope when that launches. And you see there, there's a big gap um, between the light contributed by galaxies and what we actually measure, that's huge. Well, okay, uh, faint stars, we got some of that. And that's red. And as I said, there aren't as many stars in our fields as galaxies. So, you know, that's not a big correction. But I went on and on about scattered starlight, you know, st light from stars off away from the camera coming in. It's like lens flare, by the way. You know, you see this when the sun, you know, isn't in the picture, but it's still flaring in. Well, that contributes to this. And that's our scattered starlight. These are bright stars that we're not looking at. They're not getting in the camera, but they're off and they're bouncing around those baffles and they're still putting light into the images. And so they're contributing uh, what you're seeing here and that's the goal. And I also thought, talked about that infrared cirrus around the galaxy, you know, that stuff is up there and it's bouncing in light from other stars in the galaxy and it's putting in a little fog in the images. And that's this there. And we don't really know it as well as we'd like. There's two different re research uh, uh, papers that said what it is, and one's in, in, um, in dark green. We like that better because it's smaller, so we made that more obvious. But uh, there is the one in faint pale green, and it's somewhere between that. And so this is what we're left with. And this is interesting. This now is um, all the light uh, that we think we can account for. We think we've done our homework. We think that we have seen what's there and we don't make it up to our actual measurements. There's a difference here. There is a gap, there is extra signal that's unaccounted for. Its origin and purpose still a total mystery. But whatever it is, it's as big as uh, the light from galaxies. So what we're finding here is that accounting for the faint galaxies, we still have something just as important left over. So we'll get into a little bit of how, how much light is this? And that's something I do want to explain to you. So um, if you don't like this unit over here, which is nanowatts per square meter per steradian, I have what I'm hoping is a better unit that I'd like to introduce in common usage in the astronomical world, and that's the fridge. So um, I showed you the outside of my house. And if you walked into our kitchen and opened up the refrigerator, it'd probably look like your refrigerator. And this is the middle of the night. So I, I think, you know, all of us who are bad and raid refrigerators in the middle of the night, you know what it looks like. And you can picture being in the black house and, uh, you know, nothing else on but the light from the refrigerator. You know how bright that is. And you can see, you know, it doesn't really even light up the kitchen that much. And now let's take one step further, okay? Let's not talk about my kitchen. Let's talk about the neighbor's kitchen. And so let's go um, out to the country away from the city and pick a clear, brilliant, moonless night. And here, you know, that's, I should say, not our neighbor's cabin, but let's say there in the foreground there in the right, that's your cabin. It's where you li you're living. And there you can see already that, you know, you've got more light there coming out than it's coming out of your refrigerator. And so, you know, you go to bed and it's the middle of the night and you turn off all the lights and you've left your curtains open so you can see, you know, you would see the moonlight when it comes in. Somebody drives the road along and swings the light across the lake. You know, you can probably see their lights. 
So here's your neighbor there, and they're a kilometer away from you. And your neighbor goes into their kitchen in the middle of the night and opens their refrigerator and it lights up their kitchen and the light spills out of the window and gets into your windows over here. And that's how bright this unknown radiation is. Actually, that's how bright, if you add up all the galaxies in the universe uh, in coming into your kitchen, that's how, that's how bright it is. It's very, very faint. You might notice the moon, but you probably won't be woken up in the middle of the night uh, by your neighbor raiding his refrigerator a kilometer away on the lake. But you can picture this. You know, if you look directly at it, you can see it. It's, you know, in that sense, it's interesting. It's, uh, I think, a way of feeling the light. And I'm going to give you another way, uh, and that's actually how I found this picture. Um, for those of you who know your constellations, and you should all know your constellations, um, you can see a bit of Orion here. There is Betelgeuse and Rigel and the belt of Orion and its sword underneath where the Orion Nebula is and star formation is taking place. And Orion is a winter constellation and winter is on its way. And if you get up you know, late now, you can see Orion coming up and it'll be spectacular across the skies you know, as we go into winter. Over here is the brightest star in the sky and that's Sirius. And you've heard you know, Sirius Black, that's the one he's named after. And it turns out that if you don't like my refrigerator units, then I'm gonna give you Sirius. The light coming from Sirius in the night sky is equal to this unknown component lighting up the landscape. And so if you can see a moon, moon rise with lighting up your window in the middle of the night, you probably you know, won't be woken up when Sirius clears the horizon, but that's how much light uh, makes this unknown component that we're talking about. So a little bit on what is it? So we'll go to the next slide. And I just want to show you where this is uh, quickly, another scientific slide. This is our measurement here. And the, the thing without you know, the zodiacal light, we have much smaller error bars than has ever been done before. People have tried this over and over again, but they get very large error bars. And even just the detection of the background is not particularly significant with these measurements. We have a very good detection of the background. And we take it off, we have you know, an okay detection of the unknown part. So I don't know if this will work with you, but I will try to talk your way around it. So the best guess, what are we looking at? You know, have we counted our galaxies right? You know, that's something which is frontier research, adding up all the galaxies in the universe. Uh, the yellow line is a range of plus or minus where we think it is, that's the yellow. And here's our measurements up here. And that's why we think there's something unknown, but even the Hubble Space Telescope can't see everything. And we have to extrapolate those counts that I showed you to what you can't see. And that's what this is. And if um, and there's a black line, if we extrapolate by just how it looks for the brighter galaxies, you know, and we extrapolate to the faintest possible galaxies and it doesn't change, you know, then we can't explain it. But let's say all of a sudden these faint galaxies, you can see there's more than you expect from your extrapolation. Maybe, you know, it comes up and there's you know, gobs and gobs of faint galaxies. And so that's called a steep slope that there's more than you expect. And so if there is an unknown population of faint galaxies, that could explain the light, light that we see. And so this is the exercise. We think this is, this is useful because it pushes against what we understand as the population of faint galaxies. It gives us something to check. That is, add up all the light, add up the galaxies you can't see. If there's a difference, it means something is new. Either it's galaxies you can't see, or you know, something that you haven't seen. And I say, the bet is that what we are seeing is just parts of galaxies um, that have come off or haven't been counted yet, but, um, it's something unknown, and we leave open the possibility that it's something not to do with galaxies, something unexpected, perhaps something even closer uh, in than the distant universe, which will be a surprise to us. And so with that, I should probably wisely um, fade to black. But as they say in the, um, in the old... Uh, advertisements, uh, you know, but wait, there's more. And let's see if I can do this. I was about to leave my talk, <laughs> which would be bad. Oh, now I see what I need to do. I need to stop sharing. 
I'm going to share something else. So what I told you was that we used observations um, that were taken uh, with New Horizons for something else of an archive. We actually didn't point to spacecraft that did this. We used data that had already been taken. And as a result, we couldn't be picky about you know, what we had. And I showed you that we had to take care of scattered light from other stars, and we had to account for light coming from our own, you know, scattering off the Sirius around our galaxy. But if we can pick and choose, if we can plan the observations in advance, um, we can find darker places to look, and we can make our error bars smaller to make it unequivocal that we've seen something unknown. And so the first thing to do is to test um, that possibility. And one thing that we were able to do, because we were looking at how well the spacecraft performs for future research ideas, uh, this year we set up, we picked a field that was extremely dark. Uh, it should be much, much darker than any where we've seen before. It should have no contribution uh, from scattered light off the Milky Way at all. And have some much less scattered light than we saw. We developed, I should say, the whole team you saw there with the engineers working, developed this command sequences for the, the uh, spacecraft. They were verified, tested to make sure they'd be safe, and lots of planning going into that. They were uploaded into the spacecraft uh, in the middle of September. And this is done on every few weeks for the spacecraft to run commands. A Friday ago, uh, our observations were taken on the spacecraft. Uh, and they sit in the image store, waiting till they're coming down. And so tonight, um, I'm looking here at this wonderful website you can go to. Uh, we get data from everything off the Earth, planets and the moon from with Deep Space Network. It goes back to the times of Apollo. It's how we could see the astronauts walking on the moon. It's how we get pictures back from Pluto. It's how we got pictures back from Mars and Mercury and Venus. All the planets come back with the Deep Space Network. And um, these passes are programmed very carefully to get data from the spacecraft. And if you look over here, you can see um, Goldstone. That's one of three stations spanning the world. There are three stations, one in Madrid, one in Goldstone, one in Canberra. This is the biggest, this is Goldstone. And you look here, the telemetry is active. Um, data is going up to the spacecraft, data is coming down from the spacecraft. And here's the acronym NHPC. That's the DSN code for the New Horizon spacecraft. And so right now, the large 70 meter dish at Goldstone, which is in Mojave, is talking to the spacecraft and is getting data from the spacecraft. And I happen to know that's our, that's our data that we took for a trial. So as I've been talking to you, uh, New Horizons light travel time is seven hours that our data from these images is beaming across the solar system down to earth through the DSN. And so um, after I'm done talking to you, I can uh, get rid of the zoom and other things and I can bring it up and I can see what we got. And with that, I think I'm gonna stop talking. All right, thank you, Todd. That was a wonderful talking with a great little finish in that, you know, there will be more because the data is coming down right now. Wait, wait, there's more, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Still not satisfied, yes. <laughs> I will have to say, I sort of took a riff off of one of the comments on the, uh, the chat on, on YouTube. Uh, and it turns out that you went, you joined the New Horizons team and you went over to the dark side. Well, I, 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 I can tell you, so, so I, I can't resist telling you this. So I did this and um, a paper that just got accepted is was using the light of Charon uh, to light up the dark side of Pluto. And so uh, one of the persons on the team has called me Dr. Dark. <laughs> I kind of like that. Dr. Dark. I don't know. Maybe I get a license plate printed that up. Okay. So one of the questions from our, our, our audience was about darkness and the expansion of the universe. That is the universe also dark due to the expansion of the universe? Um, yeah, and that, that in fact is correct. That's, that's a very good question. Uh, and it, it's easy to answer. Uh, I mean, there's part of the darkness is the fact that it's 
taken so long for light to get us, even from the start, that would limit the brightness. But the fact that, you know, distant galaxies are red shifted, you know, uh, that's why we have the James Webb telescope. Uh, the forming galaxies right at the start of the universe, we can't see with an ordinary telescope. Uh, their light is shifted into the infrared. So yeah, that, that is also part of the factor for why, you know, why we can only cool. see so far, you know, so see so much. All right. Well, I'm sure there were other questions that I didn't have a chance to write down, but Grant Justice has been following the uh, chat more closely than I. Grant, why don't you turn on your video and uh, tell us if, uh, what questions you found in the YouTube chat? Absolutely. All right. So let's uh, get us started off here. And this is one that I, I feel like a lot of people think but don't necessarily ask kind of what we were talking about the before question that cannot be asked yes go ahead <laughs> <laughs> yes um so and this is one of the big things with james webb and especially with space and darkness as well is when you're looking for things that are so far away things that have such small photonic signatures you have to collect so much light and be able to see it what exactly is it that you're looking for there not necessarily what heavenly body but what is it that you're detecting well it's it, with um I'm not quite sure um there's a technical thing let me give you the technical answer bring it so on it, it is light it, it's uh, for optical light we have a ccd and those were once exotic devices i did my thesis with one of the first CCDs around, but you know, you probably have two of them. Oh, you can't see that with my background coming in, but you have two of them <laughs> with you in your phone, right? Backside, front side, and that's the CCD and the sensors are not that different. Uh, the James Webb telescope uh, sees the infrared, so you need a different kind, but it's a solid state thing. Photon comes in, makes an electron. Electron, uh, you know, builds up for a bit, and then after a while, you quote read it out. You count them, and that gets turned into a number. And so everything is, if you want, light being turned into numbers, and that's what's coming down with the Deep Space Network right now. The Deep Space Network is sending us numbers, saying how bright is it in this pixel, how bright is it in that pixel, and that's what the data look like. <laughs> okay, um, kind of building on that as well. What? efforts were previously made to measure blackness like what what kind of instrumentation would you use previously before we had infrared and a lot of a lot of the more advanced stuff we have now well uh you use some of the advanced stuff people have tried this with the hubble space telescope and th this is this is the thing i mean just because something's hard um doesn't mean you don't try it and, and the fact I'm being a little cavalier is, is you always try hard stuff. It's always at the frontier. And so this question has been around for decades and people have tried it a different way. It's hard from the earth because the earth's atmosphere puts out yet more glow, you know, that, that gets in the way. But work was done, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember when this was in the late 90s with the Hubble Space Telescope. And, you know, it was bothered by zodiacal light, but there are clever people say, well, you know, I think it looks like this and I can take it out if it has this distribution. And, and they're completely right, they can do that. But it puts noise in and there's uncertainties. And the thing that's a little bit hard for people to put their head around is we often are not so much interested in the measurement, but the errors. You know, there's, well, I don't really care what the number is, but I do care if the errors are small. And so people made the measurements but the errors were just very big and they were honest about the errors. And so we tried this, there's a, a, a Japanese probe rocket called Cyber, which is for this thing. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's suborbital. And so they had to take care of zodiacal light as well. And they had ways of doing that, but again, you get large errors. And so a lot of the measurements, and I had that in the figure said, yeah, maybe something's there, but they weren't, the errors weren't, you know, small enough that you could be completely sure about that. In our right. case, the, um, yeah, we didn't the have light was always the, the major fact that you couldn't uh, gauge perfectly. You, you couldn't you couldn't get around that. And so we're not clever. We're actually lazy. You know, we're we, we <laughs> right. We're so lazy. We put the spacecraft that is this whole solar system, but it has no zodiacal light. So I don't have to do the fancy stuff. I have to worry about other things, but I don't have to worry about that. And so that makes that part easy. OK. 
Okay. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay. It's, it's basically if you if you produce your background noise by I'm a factor sorry, of I, ten, I, I, by I, a factor actually, of ten, it's you know that <laughs> that's quote quote easy, and you, then you have to worry about all the really really small things. You, you looked a little stunned there, Frank. That's what I was like. Oh my god. Oh no, I was, I was just sort of expecting Grant to jump in and. Okay. Know, okay. We missed Grant, our cues. Grant, we did. Grant, we did. Ju jump in. Jump in. <laughs> I was too busy listening. I was waiting right. for the next the next sentence to start. Okay, all, right. all right. Um. Here we go. I won't oh. let you start your sentence. I'm going to give you more. But go ahead. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> um, right. One of our returning guys. Um, what's the darkest place in the universe that you know of or have observed? Well, um, <laughs> the darkest place. You know, it's funny if you if you just you know the old dark rooms, right? If you uh, just went in, you know, to develop film and you seal up everything, that's as probably as dark as anything. No light whatsoever. <laughs> um, but no, I, you know, that's, that's not, that, that's, I can't answer that question very well because what I said so far is, you know, I just took what was off the spacecraft. What I would say is those images were the darkest sky ever seen by any spacecraft. So I would say what you have seen there is the darkest um, things they've looked at. And so, you know, the day that I'm getting down right now that while we're talking, that may be darker yet. That would actually be a record breaker. So there was a little speculation about what about a black hole? Would that be an absolute dark, like reference calibration source or something? Not that New Horizons could see a black hole, but um, you know. Well, boy, uh, huh, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to do that because, <laughs> uh, because, right? You say, well, we need a black hole. Well, point's not going to be, oh, let's get close enough to the black hole. So exactly. spread out a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, so it fills the sky like the moon or something like that. No, I, you wouldn't want to be anywhere near that. So and you, plus, you know, you, how could you avoid the photon sphere around the black hole, right? No, I mean, there's things falling into black holes, giving off light. And, and so even black holes, you know, well, yes, nothing can come up. A lot goes in when a lot of stuff goes there's in. So much, it, there's so much light around the black around hole. Around the black that hole. That it would contaminate that, all your that, observations. That, exactly. I mean, it's a great idea. It's a clever I thought it was idea. a very inventive idea. It, it's a clever uh, question, but, but, but it doesn't work. Okay. Well, I actually right. have a question myself. Did you sit there and do the calculation that uh, like a uh, 25 watt light bulb in a refrigerator is e at, at one kilometer is equal to the light from Sirius at uh, what Sirius is 8.8 .8 to light years away? No, I just looked it up on the web. You know, you have these every time. No, <laughs> <laughs> Google, Google light bulb refrigerator Sirius. Oh, yeah, somebody asked that question, you know, five years ago. And you can, yes. Absolutely. Yes. No, I, I, <laughs> No, I, I did that. Um, I want because I really wanted to visualize what the light was yeah. like, and uh, Mark Postman also did that, and we got we got the same answer. And yes, yeah, so a refrigerator lights is twenty five watts. How far do you have to put it away? It's it, it's about a kilometer. Yeah. And it turns out I wanted to do it like a star, and Sirius is the same thing. So you know, there 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 you go. So yes, I did do that calculation myself or ourselves and, and we had our math checked and and so yeah. Sirius is is one fridge of Sirius one, is one Siri provides only one fridge of light okay. one fridge of light yes yeah, so, <laughs> okay. well, let's make this I'm gonna I'm gonna try and work it. that into my, into my next talk okay <laughs> yeah I, I I want the IAU to define this to define this thing but yes a fridge of light is an open refrigerator a kilometer that's the background radiation yes. all right fantastic anything but the metric system we're using refrigerators of light to measure distance well yeah. a kilometer okay. a kilometer is in there but that you know, we'll ignore that you know, so. I know it's just it's <laughs> too right. good uh, it's too good <laughs> all right what else we got Grant all right so let's see um hmm looking through looking through <clears throat> all right um so given your field of study and the specific conditions that you use and you have to work in where would be the ideal place for us to place either a telescope or a spacecraft for your type of observations well um where new horizons is right now is pretty ideal uh, it, that that's that's hard that's hard to beat um you you wouldn't send you probably wouldn't send a spacecraft out for just this measurement um now what, what's interesting is is that if you put you know the james webb telescope out there or the hubble space telescope with a darker background boy they were a lot more sensitive to galaxies um it's a funny kind of thing right you know you know that the stars are there during daylight you know, you just can't see them because the sky is too bright. Well, the zodiacal light for 
Hubble Space Telescope, that interferes with its ability to see the faintest galaxies and the same thing for the James Webb Telescope. And so if you were to put them way out in the solar system, they'd be much more superb for faint galaxies. It'd be very, very nice. Hmm. But you know, the telemetry, the expense of operating at enormous distances, it, it makes it extremely difficult. And it's very difficult operating New Horizons. So you probably wouldn't do, you know, you probably wouldn't mount a mission just for this. So that brings up a question. Um, we've been able to contact Voyager out to about 120 AU. Yeah, 100, and, it's uh, 120, new, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so New Horizons is at 50 AU right now. Right, And it's right. moving much faster. How many more years do we have that where we can still talk to New Horizons? Um, yeah, actually, it's not moving faster. It turns out that the Voyagers are, are you know, given where they went. Uh, but we always say New Horizons had the fastest, as fastest move of any space, uh, spacecraft that we've launched. It, when we launched it, it was true. Oh, when we launched it. So okay. you, you got to read the fine print. Here, you know? <laughs> there's, I, there's fine print that you didn't read, you know. So, so Voyager got the slingshots and got faster. They, the slingshots, yeah, Voyager says, you know, no, we're, I'm, no one's going to catch me. And New Horizons didn't try to catch it. But, but your question is, and, and one of the things that's funny, New Horizons was, was compared to Voyager was made on the cheap. And we had a small dish. And so the answer is, uh, you know, we're looking to get out to 100 AU. Uh, and, you know, we may be able to make, to make that. Uh, and that will be in the late 30s. And so that's probably about, probably about where we'll go. So um, where Voyagers are now, we will probably not be able to talk to New Horizons as far as the Voyagers have gotten out. We, we just don't have the transmitter, the dish, and, and the power reserves to do that. So in the direction that New Horizons is going, uh, it's not really going to reach the heliopause, uh, is it, before uh, we won't be able no, to? No, unfortunately, yeah, we, we, sh we should not see the heliopause be before, while we can still talk to it, unfortunately. Okay, because that would be a fantastic, a, a, a wonderful verification. It, it would be yeah. great, you know, if you have something, we could go there, you know, if you have some plutonium in your pocket, you know, we could go out there and gas <laughs> up the, you know, the RTGs, right, refill that. You know, buff it up a little bit, give it a bigger dish, then we're talking. Refuel right. it, by the way, while it's up there, then we could really do something. So but, you know, <laughs> nobody's seriously talking about that. All right. Um, All right. I've Grant, got, you find, got two more questions. I've got two more to finish this up, if that's okay. Two more, I that, that, let's, let's do it. All right. Um, so <clears throat> first one off here. Um, is it possible that there are objects in the universe that are beyond what we can see now? And if true, well, realistically, we know that there are things that we can't see and can't observe. Um, but <clears throat> is there anything that you think we will not be able to observe just based on location, based on obstruction, based on uh, like uh, being near a black hole, radiation being pulled from? Is there anything that you think we won't be able to actually observe? I, let me let me answer that question a little bit differently. Um, I think you know I, that's very hard to answer, so I'm going to answer a different question that you didn't ask. Okay, fair. <laughs> I like that I, question. I, I, I have a great answer to a different question. <laughs> it's, very, it's, very, it's very political of me. It's a style. Yes, I know what you asked, but I'm going to answer something else. Um, I showed I showed you um, a picture of a galaxy in a plane. And we know already that, you know, being in the planet of a galaxy makes it very difficult for us to see what's not, you know, what, is, what we're actually blocking. And you saw there's dust in the galaxy, there are parts of the galaxy that are very difficult to see. And, you know, you think, you know, if you were in the center of the galaxy around all those stars, boy, you would have trouble seeing a distant universe. Astronomy would be very difficult. And so it's an interesting question to play a parlor game, uh, you know, astronomers, if, I don't know, I, I've never been to an astronomer parlor, but you know, if you imagine there is such a thing, you know, and, and, and <laughs> you, right. sorry, Late, sorry. In, in the late evening at the AAS meeting. Right? Yeah, I guess that's as close <laughs> as to an astronomer's parlor, yes. And, and you know, <laughs> there has to be some good drink involved for, for this. But it's, you know, a, a great question is, what's wrong with where we are? What are we missing? Because you can say, boy, I'm glad I'm not at the center of the galaxy because I wouldn't know this. Or what if I was in between Andromeda 
you know, in our galaxy and I couldn't get parallaxes to figure out distances. I wouldn't know what they were, you know. What, what, if if you, I, what if our sun was in a globular cluster, right? Yeah, exactly. The whole right. sky would be just so bright with stars and just um, destroy our. No, it, you, you'd have trouble. You'd have trouble understanding what you know what you're looking at. But there is some ways which we you know which limit our view, and I've suggested a few of them that we're in the plane of our galaxy, and so it's asking what is it that we don't know? What is wrong with our vantage point? that is limiting our ability to do this. It's like, you know, the unknown unknown, you know, maybe some of the things we think are because there's something limiting what we can see. And that's an interesting question to say, what could that be? So if that's an okay answer to the, to that, your question. I feel I, like yeah. that was, that was, that was, was reasonable. Really, <laughs> I know, ask the person to see if the needle goes up. Yeah, I don't know, you know, <laughs> <laughs> plausibility scale, you know. Frank, right. do you have any more before I ask the last one? Ask the last question. I'll, I'll have a final comment. Okay. Um, this is one, I'm going to bring it back a little bit because we're getting a little bit into the weeds here. This is one that I've seen the parlor game. Several yes, no, times. No, I, let's get out of the weeds. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should go into the weeds. That could be just as good. But go it on. could, it could. Uh, some yeah. of the chat would definitely like us to go into the weeds, but just given yeah. the amount of times I've seen this repeated, yes. what is it that causes galaxies to appear to be closer together or in like tighter formations the further away that we are observing them? I'm not sure I can answer. I don't, I don't know that that is so. Um, I've seen uh, it repeated in the chat like four or five times. I wanted to get your input here. <laughs> um, I, you, you, I'm afraid I'm baffled because I, I don't think, I don't, I don't understand that that is so. Yeah, the two point correlation function of galaxies as you, with increasing redshift. Um, well, I mean, I what, think, what, yeah. No, I mean, what we can say, you know, the only thing I can say is galaxies do like the company of other galaxies. They're yeah. not spread flat or randomly. And in fact, right, your background right there, Frank, is perfect. That's a cluster of galaxies yeah. where the galaxies are very dense and closely associated with each other. So there is that, you know, gravity pulls. But galaxies. that develops over time. It doesn't develop back. In, it it, it no, decreases no, back in no, time. No, Yeah, back in time, <laughs> galaxies are, are, if anything, less clustered together. Yeah. That's, that's how I would answer that. Okay. Okay. Solid. Yeah. So you, you mentioned an astronomical parlor and I was remembering 25 years ago um, when we were at the AAS uh, that we were talking about in San Antonio. Yes. Uh, and Neil Tyson had a bottle of wine out. Yes, he did. Um, yes. And uh, we were sitting around ch ch chatting and, and, and such. I actually remember that conversation. I remember that conversation. And I remember in particular because you said billions tonight, uh, a certain person doing a very interesting Carl Sagan impersonation <laughs> at yes. that at that astronomical parlor. Somebody somebody might have done that. I don't know yes. who would have done that. I don't know who would have done that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I was waiting for you to do the billions and billions you here tonight. Like raising the four hundred billion stars, the innumerable bounty of human existence. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I can Sorry talk for that. to yes. doing that. <laughs> all right. All right. You better give me all a right. bottle of wine for that. So uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for being here, Todd. Okay. Really appreciate having you. Thank uh, you. Thank this is fun. Thank you to everyone who's watching. Um, next uh, public lecture series will be November 2nd. Come, please join us. Thank you all and have a great day. Cheers. <laughs>